Welcome back. This should be a really short and to the point video. Um, this is just a two-step two enzymatic process, and we're going to go over the biosynthesis of serotonin from L-tryptophan. And what's worth noting at this point is that tryptophan is an essential amino acid. We do not possess the enzymes needed to synthesize tryptophan. So if we don't have tryptophan from the diet, we can't biosynthesize serotonin. So that's also worth mentioning. So you could also venture to say that a deficiency of tryptophan would also result in a deficiency of serotonin, and that's perfectly reasonable. Okay. Now, the committed and rate-limiting step in this process is catalyzed by tryptophan 5-hydroxylase. And much like phenylalanine hydroxylase and tyrosine hydroxylase, this is also a tetrahydrobiopterin-dependent enzyme. And we note the structure of tetrahydrobiopterin down here where my arrow is. Okay? That's the structure of tetrahydrobiopterin. And in the mechanism of this enzyme, it's specifically going to hydroxylate this position right here on the indole ring. That's the 5 position. So this is the 5 position on the indole ring. And it's going to hydroxylate that position. Okay, So one of the atoms of molecular oxygen gets incorporated there, but the other one gets incorporated on the tetrahydrobiopterin. And specifically, it's this hydroxyl group right here. And so as a result of hydroxylating tetrahydrobiopterin, we generate 4-alpha-hydroxy-tetrahydrobiopterin. And 4-alpha-hydroxy-tetrahydrobiopterin is of no use to us, so we have to dehydrate it first and then reduce it. So when we dehydrate it, that's through the action of 4-alpha-hydroxy-tetrahydrobiopterin dehydratase. And that gives us dihydrobiopterin. So this molecule down here, this is dihydrobiopterin. And dihydrobiopterin gets reduced using reducing equivalents from the hydride of either NADPH or NADH. And that gets us back to tetrahydrobiopterin. And therefore, we can redo another cycle of tryptophan hydroxylase or a different hydroxylase, okay, as long as the cell expresses it. Okay, now... Um, this, like phenylalanine hydroxylase and tyrosine hydroxylase, is an iron-dependent enzyme. And so it's the iron 2 plus, as you see right here. And the reason you have that iron 2 plus or that ferrous iron in the active site is because the ferrous iron is in large part responsible for binding the tetrahydrobiopterin in the active site and allowing this reaction to take place. But in any case, you use tryptophan 5-hydroxylase, hydroxylate the indole ring at the 5 position, and you get 5-hydroxytryptophan. Now, one thing you may see 5-hydroxytryptophan referred to as is 5-HTP. Okay, And there's a, there's a place you may have seen 5-HTP, and that's in a drugstore. You can actually buy 5-HTP supplements in a jar. And what it is is just 5-hydroxytryptophan. Now... What it's ordinarily used for is, or it's, it's, it's thought to um, lead to serotonin production, right? So what exactly is 5-hydroxytryptophan purported to do? Well, keep in mind that it's a precursor to serotonin. So the, the, the thought in it, or at least the logic, is that the cells that make serotonin can um, intake 5-hydroxytryptophan and then they can use aromatic amino acid decarboxylase to decarboxylate and make serotonin. So the, the, the thinking is, is that if you increase 5-HTP in the blood, it will lead to an increase in serotonin. And, and what we know is that serotonin is responsible for sleep regulation, good mood. Certainly low serotonin is correlated with depression. So one of the things that taking the supplement is purported to do is to increase the biosynthesis of serotonin through the intake of 5-HTP. Now, whether or not this is accurate, whether or not this actually takes place, is not known. Um, but what is known is that 5-HTP is able to cross the blood-brain barrier. So it does have the potential to get into the brain. That's still an active area of research, certainly a good, um, a good thing to think about. Okay? But once we generate 5-HTP, it's going to get decarboxylated by aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. And you can certainly look at the mechanism of pyridoxal phosphate-dependent decarboxylases. So this is pyridoxal phosphate-dependent. And it's going to decarboxylate the alpha carbon. So this is your alpha carbon. Again, this is your beta carbon. So the, car the carboxyl group that's going to be lost is CO2 is going to be this one. So here's our carbon dioxide that gets lost. Again, a pyridoxal phosphate-dependent mechanism, and you wind up with serotonin at the end. And the serotonin can further be processed to melatonin using a different set of enzymes. 
Now what I want to think about is what kind of cells might express these two enzymes, both tryptophan 5-hydroxylase and aromatic amino acid decarboxylase? Well, the enzymes, or excuse me, the cells that express these enzymes are going to be cells that are synthesizing serotonin, and I think that's pretty obvious. Well, let's think about some of the cells that might synthesize serotonin. Well, certainly cells in the brain, like the RAF nucleus, those are going to synthesize serotonin. Um, intestinal cells, things in the gut, will synthesize a large amount of serotonin. Um, there are certain... Um, there are certain um, cells in the blood vessels that actually release serotonin as a vasoconstrictor. In fact, the endothelial cells there release it as a vasoconstrictor. So it has a function there. And then also, um, because serotonin can be used to biosynthesize melatonin, the pineal gland also synthesizes these enzymes. Because if you're going to synthesize melatonin, you have to first synthesize serotonin. So the pineal gland also makes these two enzymes. So that's just some things that are worth thinking about. Okay, so let's do a quick recap. So tryptophan is going to get consumed by a tetrahydrobiopter-independent enzyme called tryptophan 5-hydroxylase. It's going to use one of the atoms of molecular oxygen to hydroxylate the 5 position on tryptophan. And the other atom of molecular oxygen gets incorporated into tetrahydrobiopterin to make 4-alpha-hydroxy-tetrahydrobiopterin, which gets dehydrated by 4-alpha-hydroxy-tetrahydrobiopterin dehydratase, giving dihydrobiopterin. Dihydrobiopterin gets reduced by dihydrobiopterin reductase, which burns either an NADPH or an NADH to generate tetrahydrobiopterin, thus regenerating the cycle. And it's an iron-dependent enzyme, and the whole reason you have that ferrous iron in the active site is to bind the incoming tetrahydrobiopterin. And in the process, we get 5-hydroxytryptophan, and 5-hydroxytryptophan is going to get decarboxylated by aromatic amino acid decarboxylase, which is a pyridoxal phosphate-dependent decarboxylation mechanism, and we get serotonin at the end. And one thing um, that you might also see when you see serotonin, you might also see it abbreviated as 5 is 5-HT, okay? 5-HT stands for 5-hydroxytryptamine, okay? Well, what is tryptamine? Well, tryptamine is this part of the molecule right here. This part, excluding the hydroxyl group, that's tryptamine, okay? And then if you add the hydroxyl group on there, that's 5-hydroxytryptamine. So if you see 5-HTP, that's 5-hydroxytryptophan. That's not serotonin. But if you see 5-HT, that is serotonin. That stands for 5-hydroxytryptamine. 5-HTP is 5-hydroxytryptophan. 5-HT is serotonin. And again, just a simple two-enzymatic step process. See you in the next video.